So, welcome to Be Unlimited. Um, my name is Helen Koyman, and I'm going to be your host this evening. Um, well, I'm very honored to introduce to you Mr. Guido Snell and Mr. Ilya Troyanov, which are our guests tonight. We are going to talk about Eastern Europe. Please, come on up. After you. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sits in the middle. So, um, I would like to introduce you uh, shortly. Um, Mr. Guido Snell, assistant professor at the University of uh, Amsterdam, writer of a uh, lot of books, anthologies, lots of books, <laughs> um, translator from Serbo Croatian into Dutch. Um, welcome. Thank you. And Mr. Ilya Trojanov. German Bulgarian writer, we will come back to this in a moment. Um, writer of a lot of books, a very uh, famous book in the Netherlands is um, The Collector of uh, Worlds, uh, in Dutch, The Wereldverzamelaar, um, winner of uh, several prizes, and um, living in Vienna now. Okay, my name is uh, what I already said, Helen Koyman. I'm, um, my field of expertise is, uh, is Bulgaria, and I translated a book from Bulgarian into uh, Dutch uh, from writer Yori Gospodinov, um, and I'm a journalist. Okay, what we share, I think, is our fascination for Eastern Europe. Could you, could you uh, give us um, in a nutshell, um, a reason why, why, why this fascination comes from? It's, it's a very huge question, but maybe you could, you could say some sentences about this. Go yes. ahead. Yeah? Uh, well, for me it all started with literature, really. And um, um, it's, it, it is a huge question, I, I have to admit. And, Saying that it all started with literature is not a straight answer, I know that, but um, I just happened to come across a couple of writers, and maybe we'll get back to that, uh, which had something that I did not know before, that I had not seen before, uh, definitely not in Dutch literature, uh, but also not in the literature of Western Europe. What, what was that, that peculiar thing? Well, that's, that's the huge part of the question. Mm, that's, okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fair question, but it's, um, uh, it's also a fair question. Um, on the other hand, I would also say that um, I sometimes have trouble with that question because one of the things you experience when you uh, write a lot about and when you actually travel there and stay there is that people back home, so to speak, in the Netherlands, or when, when I'm in Belgium, um, begin to consider you as a specialist for Eastern Europe. Uh, now imagine the reverse, that you're from Bulgaria, and you happen to like Dutch literature, and immediately you become a specialist for Western Europe. That would be slightly absurd. So there's a, there's a sort of um, imbalance between East and West here, and I also think that part of my fascination has to do with that. With this imbalance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Trianov. Um, this is um, your new book, which is um, tremendously interesting. I think this is about Bulgaria. Where does your fascination for Bulgaria come from? Well, I have absolutely no fascination for Bulgaria. Okay. What's good. Whatsoever. Good. 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 That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm just stuck with it. You know. Um, as you know, you can't choose your relatives, mm -hmm. and you can't choose the country you're born into. Um, now, what you can choose is to flee the country you're born into, mm -hmm. which was the decision my parents made when I was six. So I grew up outside of Bulgaria, but one of the misconceptions regarding migration is that the country you leave dies or withers away 
in a very interesting way, it actually stays with you. First of all, we always spoke Bulgarian at home. But secondly, maybe even more importantly, um, the country that you've left behind is both idealized and demonized. It's idealized in a way um, like lost paradise, because it's connected to certain memories of childhood. And the longer you stay away, and of course in those days there was no chance of returning, it develops into a kind of nostalgia. At the same time, of course, it's demonized because you fled for certain reasons, political reasons in, in this case, and uh, these reasons become all-encompassing and they become very dominant. So it's a very weird mixture, but there's always a connection to this country, a spiritual connection, a mental connection, and there's a physical connection. Now, um, during the Cold War, the physical connection was, in our case, um, the letters we received from Bulgaria, and they were always opened by the Secret Service, and I think purposely they would glue them with a yellow, very disgusting glue, which was very visible. So when you received the letter and you turned it around, there was this huge yellow stripe, which basically was the signature of the Secret Service. They announced, we read what you're writing and we know what you're doing. And um, this bizarre interaction through the filter of um, the state security then reached um, a high point when my, my grandmother used to love sweets, so we used to send her chocolate. Because one of, I think one of the reasons why communism died was they couldn't figure out how to make good chocolate. I don't know why. <laughs> it's actually quite simple, but Bulgarian chocolate was just horrendous. And uh, so my grandmother loved the chocolate we sent her, and one day she received the parcel, and one of the chocolate bars had been uh, not only opened, but actually the Secret Service guy had fit into the chocolate. <laughs> so you could see kind of, you know, there's teeth marks on the chocolate. <laughs> and, um, and many years later, I actually met um, a lawyer who told me we should have kept the chocolate bar, then we could have identified his, <laughs> his teeth. And, um, so there was, there was this very weird connection. And when I went back in December 89, there was a real <coughs> clash of, a, a real cultural shock. Actually, I would actually provocatively say the greatest cultural shock is homecoming. Because this very virtual, very imagined homeland of Bulgaria clashed with the reality of a country that was in upheaval in historic times. So to me, it was a very, very intense experience, and I started immediately trying to understand what was happening in Bulgaria. And what was happening in Bulgaria was not very different to many other countries in Eastern Europe. And um, observing it, participating in it, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that, um, made me want to write about it. Mm. And um, one of the things that I think many Western journalists uh, did not notice was the continuities mm -hmm. because it, it was very easy to see on the surface the ruptures um, and of course in that particular historical moment there was a whole kind of atmosphere of change which brought about certain expectations which were not always covered by, by reality. So I noticed more the continuity, the continuity of power, the continuity of privilege. You mean the privilege. continuity of power uh, during socialist times uh, and before, after the so-called revolution? And after, yeah, before yes. and after 89. Yeah. And um, to me, it was a very fascinated, fascinating narrative. So this is where the fascination comes in, to describe how an elite can safeguard its positions through times of up upheaval. Um, of course, this has happened before in history, but it was probably the, the only example, the only case that I would witness personally. Um, so I, that was one thing. The, the second thing was that there were so many interesting people who were completely marginalized in this society, usually people from, from the resistance whose, um, let's say, unwillingness to participate in the round tables and then the great compromise that was 89 and the years thereafter made them unwanted guests at mm -hmm. this 
great table of, of uh, simulated change. So I started talking to these people, and before I talk any further, I'll, I'll leave it there. So that, that was kind of my entry into contemporary mm. Bulgaria. Mm, yeah. this, this, this continuity, um, socialist times and after the so-called revolution, 89. Um, could you say this is, this is um, not only um, for Bulgaria the case, could you expand this to the other European, Eastern European uh, countries, or is there a lot of difference when it comes to this mm -hmm. question? Because we can discuss this, I think. You know, I had my experience in, uh, in what is now known as the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. uh, I always regretted the fact that I never visited the country before the war broke out. Uh, and so it's always been a kind of mystery, sort of intriguing, but also tragic, of course, uh, when I would talk to people who knew the communist times, who had lived through the communist mm -hmm. times, which were far from the harsh times people in Bulgaria had. I, mean, I think it was much different in Yugoslavia, the, sort of the, the liberal version, so to speak. Um, and what I was confronted with, of course, in the 90s was the brutality of the war. Um, and maybe one of the most pressing questions for people who, uh, of course, had to go through that war with, you know, first-hand experience, was the question, where did it come from? You know, did it fall just out of the sky? Of course it didn't. Mm -hmm. So there too, there had been continuities. Uh, but what were they? Was it sort of could the, the, could the hidden violence? Could you specify this? Because I well, you know, it's been. You. I mean, let's say the 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 mm -hmm. the, the, the popular version in um, uh, among some opinion makers in the West. I won't generalize, but was that you know this is just the Balkans and this is this is the way people do, the way people go about with politics and history. So it's it's local culture, and I always rejected that because. Um, um, if you grow up in the Netherlands and, you know, people in the audience who, who, who are from here, who are local, so to speak, know that as well. We, too, grew up with the story of a war as probably the most powerful narrative of who we are and, and, and what we've gone through. Um, and I don't think this was really different in, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, where it was often said that the war of the 90s was kind of redoing of the Second World War. So I thought this is not... This, this, this is probably not true, it's much more complex than that. And um, I think part of, part of the continuity there was the, uh, because there was a lot of violence too in Yugoslavia, only it sort of, it stopped basically in the 50s, when, you know, Tito created his own, uh, uh, his own liberal way. Um, but it was there, it actually happened, people were also put in camps, and they weren't, executed as massively as happened in different parts of Eastern Europe, but it actually happened. And that was intriguing and also gruesome to think about. So if in the 90s this huge outburst of violence, which we called ethnic, but maybe it was just ethnic on the surface, maybe it was just the, uh, the, the excuse people needed to, to have that war, but it was so fascinating and intriguing to look into the not-so-distant past into these continuities of violence, and that's always fascinated me. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's one common denominator, and that is that in the 80s, the communist parties started looking at the nationalist card or strategy yeah. in um, kind of furthering their interests and um, establishing a new power foundation. Yeah. So in Bulgaria, uh, in the mid-80s, you have a certain process that... Um, was very repressive towards the, the, the Turkish, the Turkish yeah. minority mm -hmm. who were forced to take on Bulgarian names and uh, were forbidden um, to have Turkish schools and so on and so forth. They reopened the camps from Stalinist times. So, for example, Beline, an island in the Danube, was reopened. There was a lot of protest. Yeah. And around that time in Yugoslavia also, there was this kind of reinvention of nationalism, yeah. which of course is completely opposed to the traditional communist ideology, which yeah. was universalism, internationalism, yeah. and so on. And the same, of course, in, in the Soviet Union. And um, I think in a way, these are 
certain structural similarities that played out differently because of the regional yeah. um, differences. But there is, I think, that that, for example, would be one kind of common stream in, in East European um, Well, it was a common history. stream during the, the 80s when it comes to um, the years after 89. Could you, could you find something in common as well when it comes to all these Eastern European countries or just did they, did they uh, grow apart or did they have... Well, whenever I meet colleagues um, from Serbia, for example, from Romania, from Hungary recently, I had a very long conversation with, with a brilliant um, Hungarian author called George Dragoman. Um, and whenever we compare notes, we're always amazed at the similarities. Mm. Uh, the main one being that when you look at the people, um, at the new businessmen or the new mm. oligarchs, whatever you want to call them, when you look at the people who own big media companies, when, when you look at the people who have pos positioned themselves well, you find certain biographies, uh, which are biographies of family continuity, of class continuity. Um, I mean, Serb you, you probably would be more competent to speak of this, but my Serbian colleagues tell me stories which are incredibly similar to what happened in Bulgaria. Um, the, other, the other thing is that even in Yugoslavia, the, uh, the power of the Secret Service was, was never broken. So many of the things that happen in these societies are completely non-transparent. Mm. So there, is, there are power plays beneath the surface. Um, and the only way you can actually uh, see them, you can become aware of them, is when someone brings out an accusation or brings out some documents from, from the archive and there's suddenly a confrontation with the past that has evidently been stage, stage managed uh, because there is no openness towards this past. So there's a selective instrumentalization of the past for political gains, but there is no open, complete and uh, transparent public discourse looking at the past. But what, what, what could be the main reason for this? It's again a huge question, but I think it's an it's a important mm. question. I really would not know, wouldn't be able to give you a clear-cut answer. That's very helpful. No, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, that's... Because it would be false to say, you know, it's just this. It's so complex. Mm. Uh, you could point at, for instance, a lack of democratic tradition and a lack of uh, civil society. <laughs> But then again, you know, I've met so many people who've put such a, hero a heroic struggle into uh, organizing uh, civil society and social life. For instance, Belgrade, which really wasn't a place of political tolerance in the 1990s, on the, contra on the contrary, at the same time had a wonderful collection of people. Um, for instance, I recall a center, uh, the Center for Cultural Decontamination. Wonderful name. Um, and evening after evening, they would have programs, discussions, they would invite nationalist politicians um, just to raise public consciousness about what was going on. And this had an intensity which I've never encountered in Western Europe, for instance. And to me, this was sort of the essence of what democracy should be. So to say that it's a democratic deficit wouldn't suffice. Um, there's also, I think, which is important, there's a kind of ideological confusion that's the nice way to put it. So, for instance, also in your book, the, uh, uh, one of the two main characters is an apparatchik and continues to be an apparatchik, only the system is called differently. It's now capitalism after 89, but he's still in power, right? Um, so, a different way to say that there's ideological confusion would be to say that people are pragmatic, that, you know, that they stick out the flag they're expected to at that particular moment in history. Um, but then again, you know, this year I went back to, uh, to Croatia after a considerable break um, and I was just incognito. I wasn't a translator, I was just swimming and lying on the beach. It was in the beautiful town of Split. You should all go there. It's wonderful, it really is. And um, the newspapers were full with the idiotic language and behavior of the then newly elected government. 
and they had a minister of culture of Muslim origin called Hassan Begovic, mm -hmm. who said the most outrageous things about the Holocaust and about Jews and about uh, Croatia and national purity. And, and you think, you know, why does this resurface again after, you know, the war has been over for 20 years? Um, so this suggested to me that there is a kind of ideological, maybe I shouldn't call it confusion, but anything can pop up just at any moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we also see this in the, uh, in the current response to, to the, the mass amounts of refugees that are entering the European Union. You know, the fact that the Hungarian parliament could have uh, had a debate about whether or not the army should be allowed to use violence against immigrants, that's outrageous. That's the kind of question that should never even enter a parliament. Mm -hmm. right? But, uh, Mr. Trojanov, do you, do, you, do you agree with uh, Hidu Snell about this? And, and um, this um, theme, this uh, refugee issue, is it also rooted in, in um, socialist ideology? Because yeah, well, this we'll, is something different, we'll, we'll I get, think. We'll get back to that. I, I just yeah. wanted to add one, one aspect that was not yet mentioned. There was a certain collusion of the Western powers with the Eastern elites. And mm -hmm. that was very evident um, just looking at, at Bulgaria. There were several instances when they did um, everything possible to make sure that basically their aim was to have what they called a peaceful transformation. So anything that might have rocked the boat mm -hmm. was regarded as a threat to Western interests. And therefore, I could actually spend the whole evening telling you of people, for example, who were in jail before 89, who were regarded, for example, by the American embassy as potential new Havels, who, when they then said that there has to be, uh, they have to start court cases against former communist um, leaders or apparatchiks, that there has to be some kind of um, massive, critical, um, follow up on the way, for example, that privatization um, was um, achieved, which was basically a form of piratization um, in which the nomenclatura held on to or basically became a, the capitalist owners of what were formerly state owned companies. Whenever such um, aims were formulated, the, in this case, for example, the American embassy would actually distance themselves from this particular individual and he would be dropped like a hot potato. Mm. Um, and the same thing when you look at in the case of Bulgaria and Romania, when they entered the EU, the EU were actually um, grossly irresponsible or maybe criminally negligent in actually um, claiming that enough progress has been made in terms of the judicial system, in terms of anti-corruption, and so on and so forth, to allow them into the EU, knowing it was so evident, uh, knowing that in no way had this pr uh, progress been achieved. So I think the, the collusion of, of the Western... Um, and also in Yugoslavia, of course, it's a very complex thing. One would have to re-examine whether certain reactions, for example, by the German government, were not instrumental in... Mm -hmm kind of fueling um, yeah. uh, the conflict. Um, I completely agree with you that there are all sorts of very complex historical lines that resurfaced. But when you, when you look at it, just to give you one example, for example, there's, um, there's an organization in, in Bulgaria that, like, it's 100 years old, that fought for Macedonia. And this organization has always been there um, it's always been financed by someone, although it has actually no substantial backing within the population. So the question then is, which are the forces in society which keep such old feuds, such old irritations and aspirations alive? And why are they kept alive? Why are they kept in the holster like a gun, waiting for a moment when they might become useful in both nationally and, and uh, internationally. Now, to answer your question, I, I think it has a lot to do with the communist past, of mm -hmm. course. Um, actually, most of my Indian and African friends refuse to travel to Eastern Europe. Why? Um, because they've um, encountered so much racism. 
I, um, actually, in my hotel room, it was funny. I'm, I'm, in, in the, I'm in the library room, and the first book I saw when I entered was by a very close friend of mine called Nuruddin Farah, who is from um, Somalia, lives in South Africa. And I remember him telling me of a trip to, um, to the Czech Republic, which we would regard as being more kind of open-minded and liberal than certainly certain countries further east. And he told me absolutely horrible stories about reactions of people just because he's, he's an African. Now, the reasons, there are probably many reasons, but just to, to, to speculate on a few of them, um, I think this basically the, the emptiness of the ideological position of the regime discredited certain ideals. And one of the, idea, uh, was, one of the ideals was internationalism. But since internationalism was evidently just like something like justice or um, freedom, it, it, it had become a completely empty word. So I think people became skeptical and therefore no longer convinced in the validity of this ideal. So they couldn't distinguish between the rhetorical emptiness of the ideal and the potential for truly establishing and living um, according to this ideal. Um, there, were, there were actually many uh, students in, in most Eastern European countries from countries of the South that were affiliated mm -hmm. with the regime. So you had um, these students living in, um, in special um, housing and, and having a special canteen, for example. There was, there was a segregation of these international uh, students, so there was no kind of interaction with the local population. Second uh, reason could be, um, of course, people couldn't travel. And as we know, personal encounter with the unknown overcomes resentment and prejudice. Mm. So without having personal experiences, it's very easy to fall into a trap of um, demagogic um, misrepresentation of, of the other. And, and the third reason is that they, they have been disenfranchised on so many levels and it's apparently quite easy to manipulate the disenfranchised with populist slogans. Um, and there are probably many other reasons, but I do think it has very much to do with, with the past. Actually, one of the best studies I've ever read on Eastern Europe looked at the interaction uh, or the, the, the correlation between a critical assessment of the past, opening up of the archive of the the Secret Service and the state security, and corruption and oligarchy. And it was very interesting that there's a very, very clear direct correlation. Those countries in Eastern Europe that had been more progressive and critical in reassessing the past had less mafia, less corruption, less oligarchy. Those where the past basically is closed um, where it's used as a political instrument, where it's still owned by the elites, there you have a, a predominance of corruption, mafia, and oligarchy. So there, that, there's a very close link, I think, between the two. Yeah. Just to come to, to this book. Um, you worked for 20, 21 years. Well, I researched for a long time. You researched yeah, for a long time. The writing was um, just for the last two years. You know. Yes. Um, why did you choose this uh, theme, the theme of so-called uh, victims and um, two sides of people that are living in, in uh, during communist times? Maybe you could you could um, summarize uh, the theme. Maybe you could, oh, could tell tell something yeah. about the theme of it. I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to summarize my own novel, but um, it's basically it's like the title says, Macht and Verset. Macht and Verset. Macht yeah. and Verset. Mm -hmm. Power it's and Resistance. Power and Resistance. So it's, it's about the very complex relationship between power and resistance. So there's one uh, main character who is someone who actually was in the act of resistance against the system, who ended up, who blew up a statue of Stalin, 
um, in Sofia who ended up in, in jail, in, in this concentration camp in, um, in Belene. And um, the other person is, as you said, Napracek. And both of these people, because of personal and political developments, are forced to return to the past. And what we see is basically how they're struggling with the past. Konstantin, the resistance fighter, by trying to find out through the archives what actually happened to betray them, what are the connections that he didn't see as a witness, um, trying to better understand how the Secret Service and the system had worked, and trying to use that as a new weapon of resistance in contemporary Bulgaria. Um, and the other one, of course, is trying to justify and um, basically camouflage his participation in the crimes of the past. Mm -hmm. So they have two very different voices. And the reason why I, I chose that was um, because I don't think there's any, there's, there are very few things that are more important in a society than this particular relationship. I think that power is only limited through the continuation and the persistence of daily resistance. I actually strongly believe that that is also what defines a democracy. So if we use this term civil society quite loosely, I think if we were forced to be more precise, we would say civil society is the ability and the energy of many individuals to act and participate in different forms of resistance. And the moment you don't have that, I think you cannot safeguard freedom through institutions. I think uh, freedom, openness, pluralism is only established and prolonged and expanded by individual acts of resistance. So since it's one of the most important, um, to me, one of the important, uh, most important themes, as a novelist, evidently, I, I want to reflect upon that. And the second reason is that there are actually very few novels, interestingly enough, written about this. Now, when you, when you look at the novels, and I, I read most of them written um, in Eastern Europe, it's very interesting to see that many of the, as you say, victims were real victims in that they were innocent, very much like in Kafka's um, mm -hmm. uh, The Trial, in that they didn't actually know why they were arrested and... Many um, books um, from Eastern Germany are like that. Some poor sod mm -hmm. who just happened, happened to be kind of regarded as some threat to the system, ended up losing his job or spending a, or he made a, a stupid joke, you know, stuff like that. So I really wanted to focus on those people who, in times when everybody thought that resistance was impossible, who had the imagination and the courage to actually engage in resistance, because to me that is the supreme example of conviction. If you do something when you are assured of success, or when success is quite likely, then one could make the argument it is partly tainted by pragmatism. But if you do something in times when you knew that you were going to be killed, or you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail and then outside of society, you were actually truly living your conviction. You were completely true to your convictions. Um, so that, that, that interested me. And on the other side, in literature, there's so many villains who are exaggerated. I mean, who are basically variations of, of Goethe's Mephisto. So they are like, they're the geniuses of evil. They are, they, they have a certain brilliance, they have a certain um, dominance. And I was more interested in the normality of evil. Um, the system is made up by normal people like Methodi, um, people who are, of course, opp opportunistic, but who are not, for example, sadists. And it's very interesting, I spoke to dozens of people who were in jail. They said that there were very, very few people of sadistic character. Actually, most of them, even when they tortured, tortured out of necessity. 
they were they they felt that they had to do it, but not out of pleasure. If we look at our popular culture films um, um, and um, novels, you would find a prevalence of the sadistic kind of persuasion. You know, people who really enjoy um, torturing other people. So, so I thought it would be very important to try and describe someone who was the backbone of the system. Um, but at the same time was normal through and through. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add something? Well, um, yeah. what you're describing right now is part of the reasons I liked the book so much. It's, um, you know, it's what uh, was it Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil, which is, has also become almost just only a phrase, but there's really truth to it. and um, It made me think of a decisive moment, which uh, which is interesting because it has been recorded on on on, on Yugoslav television in, the, in 1989. Uh, it was in the career of uh, Slobodan Milosevic, and um, here is someone when he ended up here in the Hague, uh, not voluntarily. He, uh, you know, he was branded as a sort of the, the incarnation of evil and the butcher from the Balkans, or. Maybe that was Mladic, I don't know. But anyway, you know, these metaphors were around. And when you look back at that TV fragment from 1989, he is in Kosovo. And the local Serbian population there is asking him to act because they feel threatened, rightly or not. There was some paranoia there in the Serbian minority. And he doesn't know what to do, and he withdraws. And later on, he returns, and he's a different man because somehow he sensed that, whether it was because of career motives or, I don't know, maybe just his sense of power that he had at the right moment, he reappears, no longer insecure, and he knows what to do, and he gives the political speech of his life, which launched him as the mastermind right, of, uh, of uh, uh, the nationalist movement in Serbia. He probably was still the same man when he came out. He just found out something else about himself. And this is what makes the character Methodi that interesting. He really remains the same person throughout his life, I think. Of course, you know, he accumulates experiences and wealth, also very important in his case. Um, but I think his character really remains the same. Okay. Still, um I can't escape from the feeling that um, there is a difference between writers that were born and raised in Eastern Europe and writers that were born and raised in Western Europe and how they write about the socialist time. Like, for example, the Bulgarian writers I know, um, they write more about uh, daily life, the, the, the small things, and also the happiness that was um, visible and was felt. Um, and the, the Western European writers um, more write about maybe the harshness of the regime, the, the, um, this, 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 this good and bad. Um, who do who, you, do are, you, who do are you thinking of? Which For one? example, um, I'm thinking of um, the, the Belgian writer Johan de Boos. I don't know if you, if you know him, but he, he has some novels about uh, Soviet Union times, uh, Yugoslav, uh, mm -hmm. which is it's, 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 it's about this, this, this harshness. This, and, uh, for example, the, the uh, novel that I translated from Georgi Gospodin is more about small things and mm. um, going to school. Wh which and of the two did you translate? Which of his two novels did you translate? Uh, Physica Natugata. Okay. Yes. So, w w could you could you tell something about this? Do you agree with me? Do you feel this uh, in that way, or am I completely wrong um, when I'm <laughs> stating uh, this? I don't. I mean, I'm not from there, so I'm an outsider in the double sense. You may consider yourself as an outsider because your childhood was cut off and then you left, um, but still, it's or maybe because of that, it's so hard to generalize. Um, you mentioned George Dragoman. Um, and Who he, is, by the way, from there, and yeah. there's nothing harsher than Dragoman's novels. Yeah. So and I'm not it, sure and it is about daily life. I remember a gruesome story situated right after Chernobyl took place. 
and he's in the local football team, and they're all horribly afraid of the trainer because he's this... There's, there you have a sadistic yeah, person. Yeah, that's a sadistic person. And, and the narrator, who may or, not, may or may not be Dragoman himself, he's the goal man. And a goal man needs to dive to catch the ball. But, you know, the advice was not to touch the wet grass right after Chernobyl because the danger of contamination was there. So there you have a story that can't be more daily in its theme. But the overall picture is so gruesomely political, and so, mm. so it's. But it's he's a fantastic writer. It's a beautiful book. I think it's called The White King. The White King. Yeah. The White King. Um, maybe when people write about daily life and do not mention the larger political context, the local readers know that at the same time it is always about the larger picture, because it's in it's in your. Or you're a severe case of repression. That's also possible. But you know, it's mm -hmm. the context is there, inev in inevitable. Mm. I, I think what the White King, and if you, if you haven't read it, it's I think one of the best novels yeah. written in recent years. Um, what it shows is that even if you focus on everyday life, the repressiveness of the regime filters down even to that childhood level. It's basically about children, but the violence of this regime is everywhere. That's why we call it a totalitarian regime. So to answer your question, I think those authors um, from the East who do not depict this reality are basically running away from it. Because just imagine you were to write books like that about fascism. People would be appalled. They would say, they would actually accuse you of running away from the true issues. They would say, you know, how can you describe Germany, Italy, Spain, everyday life, happiness, Okay, small problems here and there, but kind of, you know, you can, you can get by, life is fine, you can focus on other things. How can you not describe the pervasiveness, the destructive pervasiveness of this system? So basically what, what you're asking is, do they have a true understanding of, of what the system was? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, the, is it the lack of analytical skills or is it actually just a lack of courage to, to address the main question what what what, the, what is it well i don't yeah. know I, but there's so many authors yeah. i don't know the, i no, don't no, know them all but no. uh, but there's definitely especially in the 90s if you had written a book like that in bulgaria that would have been the end of your career you wouldn't have received any funding you wouldn't be published you wouldn't be reviewed and so on and so forth so um I think there is certainly a, I mean, things are changing, but for a long time, there was, it was in their self-interest to avoid. And one of the reasons why it works with, with Dragoman is because he's a Hungarian from Romania, so he writes about Romania and the Ceausescu regime, but he lives in Hungary. And um, so that, in a way, allows him to be maybe more radical than he, he could afford to be if he had written about Romania. Mm -hmm. well, may I ask you, you, um, you fled Bulgaria when you were six years old. Mm. Um, do you consider yourself a German or a Bulgarian writer or it's a very... Neither nor. Neither nor. What, what do you consider yourself? Are you a migrant? Are you a refugee? What, what, what are you? <laughs> I'm complicated. <laughs> 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 well... <laughs> yeah. The counter question would be, are there uncomplicated people? I don't know. Some, some people seem to um, be comfortable within such definitions and yeah. seem to accept them. Yeah. To me, they are completely... Meanless. Mean, meaningless mm. for, for me in my life, so... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because uh, yesterday I uh, read uh, a review of your book in Bulgarian and there they uh, called you a, a, a writer, Bulgarian literature. So there, sometimes um, they consider you as a Bulgarian writer, in Germany you are a German writer. Oh, it, it, is it completely meaningless? I mean... Well, there, there's, a, there's a proverb in Zimbabwe, a Shona proverb, which says that only other people call you human. <laughs> or only other people can call you a human. 
mm -hmm. uh, which basically shows very clearly that any kind of denomination is outside of the limits of my own influence. You know, people call you things. Mm -hmm. And if people have the need to simplify discourse by very rough categories, or if they instrumentalize it, basically in Bulgaria what happens is when I win an award, they say, our tron have won an award. And when I write an article about Bulgaria, I say, this German doesn't know anything about Bulgaria. So <laughs> it's, 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 you know, just a, a practical thing. <laughs> pragmatic thing, maybe Very also. pragmatic, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, this book is um, a book, um, what, what, what would you like to call it? Uh, which genre is this? Could you, could you, could you, is this faction, is this, what, what? No, it's what? a novel. It's a you did 20, 21 years, you did research, you talked to a lot of people, you collected testimonies, you interviewed people, it's, it's almost an, a journalistic approach. Well, the, the thing is, well, you could even say it's a historic, and it's the work of a historian. Uh, the reason I did it was not because I, I, I feel that this is a necessary preparation for a novel, the reason I did it was because no one else had done it. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. If there had been access to all that information, I wouldn't have had to do it myself. So in a way, the long research history is also um, an expression of the political landscape. Um, I, had to, I had to work with the archives. I had to work um, as an oral historian because very few other people had done that work. That's, that's the only reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and actually, this, this is a very important, uh, sorry, I just remembered. Um, I had a discussion in, in last year, in, in, which was very interesting, in Oxford, because they had assembled a, um, a political scientist, a historian, and um, a literary um, um, scientist. And the historian said something very interesting that I hadn't thought of, but it made a lot of sense to me. He said that one day the, he, he um, is particularly competent to talk about this because his field of expertise is the Soviet Union. So he explained that during a certain period of time he had limited access to the archives. This access was closed. But in years and decades to come, at some point, when enough time has passed, the archives will be open. Not only the archives of the Secret Service, but there are so many other archives which have not been looked at at all. The archives mm -hmm. of the Communist parties, of the Consumer, of the, of the affiliated the parties, of um, uh, the prisons, mm -hmm. um, of, and so on and so forth. Um, when these archives are opened, his question was, who will help historians to find the their way around these and through these archives. Who will give them a critical counter view? Who will give them a perspective? Because you can, I think that's one of the things the novel tries to show, you cannot rely on the factual content of these documents. Because the Secret Service operated basically like a third-rate novelist. They invented stuff, they falsified stuff, they exaggerated stuff, and so on and so forth. So if, as a historian, the only thing you can work with are these archives, if the voices of the witnesses, the voices of the people who experienced it, are not there, and they will not be there, because out of the several dozens of people that I spoke to, only two are alive, so basically, it, within a few years' time, everybody will be dead, then who is going to enable a kind of multifaceted, multi-perspective, critical assessment of these archives. And if that becomes progressively more and more difficult, then we have a very tragic situation that at the end of the day, after 30 or 40 or 50 years, the archives of a dictatorship will have the final say. They will be the ones that will define how we talk about the system, how we perceive the system. They will be being third-rate authors, they will be the writers of the defining narrative. 
And that is, to me, a horrendous, mm -hmm. absolutely horrendous um, mm. um, thought. And when you think of the enormous work done after 45, I mean, how many authors, German and non-German, interviewed witnesses? I mean, there's so many, there are thousands of books of uh, so, uh, interviews with survivors, interviews with perpetrators. There's so, there's so much oral history, there's so much um, very precise um, examination of the archives and counterpositioning with what we know from other sources. And even I, uh, the other day in Berlin, there was a conference on memory and uh, justice. And uh, I was on the panel with, with a German Jewish um, author, uh, Gila Lustiger. And she said something very interesting. I didn't know that the Jews started right away after um, May 45. They started recording their own testimonies. Hmm just out of an understanding that the most important thing is to have a reliable narrative of the historical um, phenomena as opposed to the way other people with other interests and other groups uh, will, will depict this. So I, th I, th I think it's a very human instinct to want to tell your story, but it's also a very necessary aspect to how we then, in a very complex process, develop a historical, a reasonably exact historical narrative. And so I think that is, that is one of the, the grave dangers, particularly in Russia, where at the moment it's close to impossible to do any serious critical historical work. And I, I, I was in Mo, um, Moscow a few years ago, and I went to see this wonderful organization called Memorial. Mm -hmm. And it's just utterly frustrating and tragic how difficult it is for them to do any work. I mean, basically, the state is trying to sabotage their work every step of the way. Yeah. Would you like to add something? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think this is where the, 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 uh, the function or the task of fiction lies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recall there's a group of artists active in Belgrade collaborating with people uh, from all over Bosnia, artists as well and scholars. And what they have been working on is the, uh, the way the Red Cross and affiliated institutions deal with uh, whatever they find in the mass graves that have been opened. And the Red Cross doesn't have an outspoken political agenda. They are just there and they're there to uh, identify whoever got killed. Um, but what they do, for instance, and this is what this group of artists is so concerned about, once an identification has been done, they also put a label of national affiliation to the remains of that particular person. So you're no longer just your name and your surname, you're also Muslim, Croat, or Bosniak Muslim. And they say that even if the intention is okay, the Red Cross is, you know, I mean, it's just doing its work, so to speak. That's where politics already start. And this, I think, is where the role of fiction and of maybe of art more generally lies, is to uh, retrieve that human moment to say, no, this person is not in the first place or was not in the first place a Muslim or, I don't know, a Catholic Croat. He was a human being with his or her particular history. And you can only retrieve that through fiction, because that's where you create the narrative about somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And um, even if you're totally wrong with your novel, it will give people a coherent story to which they can respond, and there can be debate about it. But it will be on the basis of how you interpret individual lives, and the role that people have played, and the decisions they made. It won't be about the grand schemes of the Secret Service, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, when it comes to fiction and non-fiction, um, you, Mr. Snell, you uh, wrote some anthologies. I think where there is also an aspect when it comes to uh, this brewing of fiction and non-fiction. Well, it's um, even worse. I wrote a whole PhD about it. Okay, and, uh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that. And, 
and there I also did not find clear-cut answers as to okay. distinctions. And uh, I mean, the interesting part starts where things get blurred, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so that, does it, sorry, but uh, yeah. does that mean now that you're hugely competent <laughs> or utterly confused? What I'm, so, I'm, I'm so competent that I know that confusion is the only wise attitude. That's the uh, okay. no, that's 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 a silly thing to say. The um, um, what did I want to say? What, what did you want to sorry, ask? Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> it's, it's confusion, you see. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. That's, that's, you are also uh, uh, searching the boundaries between yeah. non fiction and non fiction and your, yeah. in your ontologies. Oh, what, 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 what is the purpose of it? Why, why are you doing this? Why, what's it's not, there's not really a purpose to storytelling. Uh, this is just the way things go. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, when I relocated with my family for a year to Istanbul, um, I had a plan for a, a novel, and the novel was to be situated in Vienna, the 1910s, Sigmund Freud and his pupils, and, and then I ended up in Istanbul, and I thought, this is ludicrous, I'm never going to write a novel about historical Vienna in a city such as Istanbul, just because it was overwhelming. Uh, th let's say the, 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 the facts, the factuality of a city such as Istanbul with, you know, 15 million inhabitants and um, the different ways that I encountered there. Um, but I also did not have a plan to write about Istanbul because you can't model a book on a city such as Istanbul. It's simply too vast. There are too many different people there, too many different histories there. You have to make choices. And um, so what I did, and it was not my intention at all to write a book about Istanbul, I was just writing reports back home to my brother, to friends, and I put them on a blog so people could read it. Uh, and this was in the beginning, of course, about you know, the logistics when you relocate from one country to another. So you deal with customs, which is a particular challenge in Turkey. Um, you deal with, uh, you know, getting your, uh, your permit to stay to, uh, uh, in order to be able to get a mobile telephone, for instance, in Turkey. So, you know, you went to all these institutions. Um, and what I discovered at a certain point is that when you're an outsider, and we already spoke about being an outsider, um, it's really tempting to not so much make up stories, but you simply discover that there's a space in between the way you think and the way you might think things are actually being done in that city. Who are the people you're dealing with? So there's room to speculate. And inevitably this leads to stories where you have to mix fact and fiction. So you're guessing why have people treated you the way they did? Why was I refused that permit to stay for such a long time, for instance? Mm -hmm. Was it personal? Was it bureaucracy? How about the guy I was dealing with on that particular Monday morning? Maybe he had a bad weekend. Maybe he thought, oh, you know, the tall Dutch guy, he can wait for another three months and I'll let him come back for another ten times. Eight, seven, something like that. So, there is room to speculate. And this is where the beginning of stories always are for me. It's also dangerous because um, one of, I think one of the demands to good literature is, um, and this, this goes way back of course to Aristotle and his ideas about good storytelling basically, your readers have to believe you. And either you're a good liar, which I'm not, I really I can't lie, um, or you tell your invented stories in such a way that people have to believe you because they're like real life, and you know, they're based on real life. And I don't think anyone ever read a book of fiction without putting at least 60-70% of reality into it. I really can't imagine. Even, even someone like Kafka, for instance, you know, whom we may think of as someone who just, you know, maybe it was a kind of dream reality that he... But there's so much reality in there, you know, in the way people speak and, you know, the... the the way he describes the faces and the hands and the bodies of his characters and you know he must I'm almost inclined to say that he must have seen that in order to be able to describe that mm, okay. um, sorry just one thought um, I think your question assumes that there's a clear difference between fact and fiction um, which one might challenge um, one of the reasons being is that we're talking about a lot 
um, about memory. Mm-hmm. I think in memory, um, you have neither nor. You have a very complex interaction between the perceived notion of uh, a long gone reality um, through the filter of a very personal interaction with, with, with reality which taints it, which changes it, which falsifies it. So I think as a novelist you have to look at the difficulty of finding, that's at least the way I write, a multi-perspective which encompasses the unreliability of memory um, as opposed, let's say, to someone who does uh, an oral history, um, just lets one witness speak and then assumes that this is what happened, which I would always doubt. And the reason I doubt it is that I have, I've had a lot of personal experiences researching this book, um, that people who were witness to this very same thing told me very different and very mm-hmm. differing accounts of what happened. Especially if these experiences were traumatic. To give you one example, uh, on this island that I mentioned, Beline, mm-hmm. there was uh, an uprising um, of the prisoners. And um, those who were regarded as being particularly active, it, it was in the middle of winter, were put on a boat, the Danube was frozen over, and basically placed on this boat in the middle of the Danube or in the canal between the island and and the Bulgarian shore, and left there with basically hardly any clothes. They just had some some shirt on. And um, so they, like like cattle, they basically tried to warm one another in an absolutely horrific thing that lasted for several days. Most of them died of, um, of cold or exertion, exhaustion, whatever, and a few survived. I interviewed three of these survivors and their recollection was at times very, very similar and at times very, very different. Now, if I was a historian, I would have a real problem. If my aim was some kind of factual representation of these events, I would find it very, very difficult. But as a novelist, this is actually not a problem. I realize that this is kind of, this is truth. Mm -hmm. The plural, or the plurality of memory is, is truth. And therefore, I just have to be truthful to this realization. I have to be careful to give room to as many different recollections, understandings, positions, philosophies, mentalities, and so on, as possible, and to let the the reader basically then come up with his interpretation of some form of individual truth. So I would would completely agree with you that, uh, Guido, that in a way novels are superior because they allow for this flexibility, they allow for this width, they are less burdened also by certain um, ritualistic concepts of the narrative and of kind of processual aspects, like in court. In court, the problem we have, why, why we meanwhile doubt that, and The Hague is a good place to talk about this, mm. why we have such serious doubts as to the capability of courts to come up with the truth is that courts are so bound by certain processual um, reglementations and therefore are very are the exact opposite of a novel. They're very inflexible. Mm. Um, and there's a certain process of truth finding or, or truth assessment which is um, very regulated as opposed to the kind of the dynamics of... Um, a fictional um, storytelling, which is why also if you if you if you've studied the life of someone who, like I did with Richard Burton, 
about whom a lot has been written, you find that the biographies actually have completely differing assessments on mm. all major issues. Just to give you one funny example, late in his life he married a very pious Catholic woman called Isabel. So Richard Burton, who was kind of the culturally and religiously most dynamic, multifaceted person you could imagine, marries this very pious woman. One biography says this marriage was made in heaven. The other biography, and both of them are very serious biographers, the other biography says never were two people less suited for one another than these two. <laughs> now, both of them reached this assessment looking at the same documentation, the same letters. And this, this is kind of, this is documentation, this is factual. I think um, I would actually um, prefer to rely on a, a novel's reimagination than this kind of false um, reality that factual representation claims for itself. Okay, thank you. I think we have to wrap up. I would like to uh, invite the audience to ask some questions. Yeah, just a, just Did you do some water? Yeah. Yes. Um, to Mr. Well, not mine, because I'm, 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 I'm not in Bulgaria, but okay. a Bulgarian, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I was just wondering, how has your book been received in Bulgaria? Has it uh, created a row or anything? Yeah, ki kind of. I mean, there was a, I just came back from Sofia a few days ago. There was, there was um, a lot of interest. There was a very moving premiere. Um, many people stood up. Um, some of them cried. Um, it was... Um, one of the words that was often used was catharsis and the necessity for that and um, how Bulgarian society lacks it and how important a book like that could be for such a process. And um, there were, of course, you know, journalists who, let's say, are less open-minded um, or more entrenched in other positions. And there are others who were very very welcoming and very supportive. So, uh, yeah, but all in all, there was quite a, quite a good reception. Does it answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Do you think that uh, countries with a religious uh, orthodox tradition, such as Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, are less prone to reach a civil society than countries with a Catholic or Protestant tradition, such as Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Uh, are you, uh, uh, is your question for both gentlemen, yes. or just okay? Serbia for you, Bulgaria for you. Go ahead. Well, you know, Serbia, this, I, can, I can give you a straight answer. No, I don't think it plays any, any role. I know the theories, and I know, for instance, that Yulia Kristeva wrote a ludicrous article in the 90s that because Orthodox Christianity treats uh, the Holy Trinity differently. They're more prone to becoming nationalistic. I, don't, I, I never saw the connection. Uh, the counter-argument would, of course, be Croatia. If you need you know, two countries with their internal political dynamics who together created a war, there you have it. And Croatia is, I can assure you, as Catholic as one can imagine. That's, yeah. Well, also similar theories, I, I remember very well, um, decades back, similar theories were used to explain why there was fascism in, in Spain and Italy. People would say that the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, the fact that church is, um, in these countries was always involved in the power play, it was at times part of the state or even at times it... Um, controlled the state, that because of that there's a kind of more auto autocratic tradition, while the prot Protestant one is kind of more one of individual um, self-realization and so on and so forth. But um, nowadays we have this claim in regard to, to Islamic societies, that because of Islam... But when you look at the whole of history, all these um, theories don't really hold up, because you have also in Islamic history you have periods of time when you have, um, in those eras, very progressive 
societies and systems. You have great rebellions. You have um, one one could call them kind of early anarchistic upheavals, especially among the Shia. Um, so I think these are oversimplifications, oversimplif usually. Um, I think any model that tries to explain complexity by one causal um, fact or phenomenon is usually not really um, substantial. Okay. Please, over there. Thank you very much. Um, my question is actually for uh, Mr. Snell concretely. At the beginning of the talk, uh, you said that um, in the countries of former Yugoslavia, things seem to be bubbling still, uh, about to possibly erupt, about maybe not, even 25 years after the war. Um, I would like to know why do you think these things happen there now, are still lasting? If, of course, I know this is a very complex, conversa uh, very complex answer, but in your opinion, like that. And at the beginning also of the conversation, we were talking, either of you two gentlemen was talking about the deficit of democracy. Um, it seems to me, based also on my own experience, that uh, in the Eastern societies, indeed, there is a def deficit of democracy the way we see it here in Western society. But at the same time, as you both said, there is a, um, a civil society in Eastern Europe. So if there's a def deficit of democracy, how does the civil society actually appear there if there's no one who can talk them before, from before? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, you know, I, I'm afraid that things are bubbling because things were never really settled in 1995 and, and 2000, 2001. Um, there is the, the, the threat or perhaps already the reality of a referendum in Bosnia uh, about independence of the Serbian part. Um, and maybe even much more important, there is the ongoing issue of the sort of the, the, the story of the war in the 90s that was never settled. There is no consensus in the region about this war. Now imagine that Germany and the Netherlands, who had their rivalry, 40-45, um, never managed to settle scores in the historical sense that the Germans were still adamant as to their role in the war and the Dutch were also. You know, imagine two neighboring countries living together in such a situation. Of course, things develop differently here on the, in, in the western half of the continent. Um, and I'm afraid, because you know, we're talking 20 years now since the end of the war, that things haven't really evolved in the meantime. And um, I think this is one of the problems. Uh, the other problem is something that we never really foresaw in the 1990s, and that has to do with globalization. It's the, uh, and I'm of course talking about the, uh, uh, the mass immigration into the European Union, and it's going precisely again, not again, but it's going precisely through, uh, through the Balkans, and it's putting a lot of, lot of pressure on the, uh, uh, on the societies there and on the governments. Um, at the same time, we're talking about civil society, or I think I mentioned it. Um, you know, Hungary has had really very bad press in terms of, you know, the way immigrants were treated. And there was the referendum uh, last weekend, which fortunately was not valid, although the government has its ways with the result of their own referendum. Um, you know, there are also fabulous examples of people in Budapest um, welcoming refugees, waiting at the Kelati station, um, uh, you know, taking them home, cooking, uh, doing whatever they can, because, of course, this is not just about democratic tradition and whether it goes 20 years back or 40 or 50 years, it's also about a sort of ingrained sense of being human, right? So, if the Zimbabwe saying says only other people can tell whether you're human, of course, but, you know, there is a sort of sense of decency which never abandoned people in the end. It's just that sometimes we don't see it, that's, <laughs> to put it mildly. And, um, um, and maybe a third part of an answer would be that people just want to forget. They want to get on with their lives. 
you know, when I was back in Croatia this summer, you know, the inevitable talk to the taxi driver, always fun. You know, people have different stuff on their minds. They don't want to talk about mass atrocities in the 1990s, even if they took place 20 kilometers further on. They're worried about their pension, they're worried about their mortgage, and they're worried about the health of their parents who are getting older and who don't have a pension. You know, this is what, this is what, so. But then again, here, like we were talking about, you know, uh, uh, just wanting to write about daily life and daily matters, here too, there is, of course, a grand context. I mean, it's always there. Well, maybe just one thought in regard to civil society. It, it sometimes explodes without pre-warning. I was just thinking as you were talking of a very fascinating aspect of Bulgarian history. I don't know whether you know, Bulgaria never sent a single Jew to the death camps. Although they were um, part of the Axis, they were on the side of Nazi Germany, and although the king wanted it. Interesting thing is that, and, and this was a military government, and, and uh, one could basically call Bulgaria in those times a, also a fascist state. But for reasons not yet explained, at least I haven't read a really profound explanation, there was a sudden outburst of what you call decency, and people actually went onto the streets, and the church participated, and, and citizens participated, and basically stopped the very first planned deportation. And after that, within the borders of Bulgaria, not a single Jew was sent to the death camps. Um, that, things like that have, have always fascinated me. Why is it that suddenly the civic society awakens, suddenly finds a voice, finds an energy? I think part of the problem we have, or I have as, as a politically active citizen, is that it's very difficult to find the solution. If we knew exactly how it works and why it works, one could um, participate in accelerating such processes. But I think a lot of it, and the other way around as well, why are people suddenly so, so quiet and, and suddenly accept um, certain negative developments? It's, I think it's, um, to, to a certain extent, it's a mystery, at least to me. Over there, this lady, you had a question? Well, yes, I, oh, sorry. Um, but it goes back to my neighbor, so I had a little interjection. We talked about religion, and then I thought, how about the Enlightenment? Is that perhaps a, a border, a, like a cultural border or historical border? And the second is just a, a comment, um, listening to your very interesting conversation. I remembered that at the VU, uh, Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam, the other one, um, um, the neighbors. We had we had a we had a chair, uh, a Jewish professor who held a chair on uh, history through fiction. It was actually his um, uh, his aim to explain history through fiction. So it's a lot about what you were talking about. So. Mm. Dan Mayers is his name. He went back to Israel. Could you, could you please uh, summarize the first uh, question? No, well, we were talking about um, the relation orthodoxy and, and civil society, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, then the, the examples were given, well, we can't really make a relation between that. But how about the Enlightenment? Um, that was a, a typical mm -hmm. kind of for formation of the mind, which uh, is perhaps some kind of cultural border, but I'm not sure. Well, maybe your take is very different, but, but I'm hugely skeptical of such claims for a very simple reason that they keep coming up in Germany now, mm. and they're used very much in, to establish a divide between Western societies and Islamic societies. And I'm, I'm always so completely shocked because as you know, nearly all great philosophers of enlightenment are Germans, and it led to the Third Reich. So, I mean, evidently enlightenment doesn't safeguard society from the worst that has ever happened on this planet. So I, I really don't think there are such uh, simple connections. It's, it's very, I think it's very practical and, and good for in, in, in the political discourse, because it... Um, it's used, I think, very much as an instrument now, as a weapon. Um, and also, it establishes a claim that cannot be fulfilled. I think that's the dangerous 
uh, discussion at the moment, because there's no way the Islamic world can now stand up and say, oh yes, we missed out on enlightenment, let's start with enlightenment now. It does, doesn't work that way. So basically you are asking the other side to do something which it couldn't possibly achieve, and therefore you're putting the blame on the other side and the ball on the other court, on the other uh, uh, half of the court, and you can lean back and say, well, in a way, unless they become enlightened, tough luck, you know, they're not going to be civilized. And it repeats those kind of, I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, you, you, um, you, were, you were claiming that, but I'm just, saying, <laughs> I'm just saying why I have a certain aversion to um, giving explanations linked to such things like enlightenment, religion, or other. Um, I th the, the big problem is that also it repeats colonial uh, narratives very much. Basically, the colonial narrative was always that the locals lacked something. To give you, I, I lived for six years in Bombay, so to give you an Indian example, um, the British always claimed that India was too religious, that they lacked secularism, and therefore they could never establish this modern state and society like the British. The only problem with that argument is that in Sanskrit, there are more secular and more atheist texts than in the whole Western tradition. So basically, such claims are a combination often of ignorance or willful ignorance, and um, they're used as a method of subjugation or dequalification. Um, one would have to look at Indian history, and one would have to ask the really interesting question, why at certain times was there a predominance of secular and atheist texts? And why in other periods of time was there um, a kind of um, re-establishment of religious dominance? And, and that, I think, is, is very difficult because it has a lot to do with outside pressures, inside pressures, with social, economic, and other uh, factors which play into this. And um, it's... It, it, the narrative, the, the, the discourse becomes then very complicated and um, thus less politically uh, suitable for political instrumentalization. Mm -hmm. The second question refers to history. But maybe, sorry, to maybe, maybe Guido has a has different take on I that. I totally disagree with you. Great. No, no, <laughs> no, I don't. I just want to add, you know, being a scholar of, uh, uh, of, of, of Eastern Europe, that's too vast, but, you know. From the perspective of um, uh, uh, the Slavic peoples, the Enlightenment is deeply problematic because it's the first time they're widely described by philosophers from Germany, like Herder, uh, and from France, obviously, Diderot was the, uh, and, and Voltaire. Um, it's not very nice how they're described. So Herder, for instance, describes the Slavic peoples as uh, docile. Uh, um, docile. Docile. So, so, you know, no backbone. Really a Slav mentality, like mm. slaves, uh, people with no history. And Himmler quotes him, by the way. And Himmler quotes him, and, well, yeah. And Herder says Africans have no history, and so on and so yeah. forth, yeah. So, you know, what seems a really lofty and beautiful project in Western European intellectual history um, is really not the case when you take a different perspective on the same set of ideas which doesn't rule out that in the Western European context, the Enlightenment was hugely important. I mean, some basic values were formulated back then, but it's an entirely different ballgame what you do with that same set of rules these days. So the whole sense, which is really to me the, the essence of Enlightenment, the whole sense of what civilization is, it's also the invention of the notion of civilization in the French tradition back then. Um, if you appropriate that, which is happening right now, right? There's this sort of, again, this disbalance between Western Europe, which is sort of the bulwark of Enlightenment values, and the rest, including Donald Trump and all the others, and Eastern Europe, and which is not. Um, how civilized are we, if we're really honest? You know, uh, if you read in the newspaper almost on a daily basis that on the outskirts of Europe, people are drowning every day, trying to get into the Union. That's not 100% something that we can solve, but it's still something that I think is not as acutely on our consciousness as it could be. 
right? I mean, we do share that border with Italy and Greece, after all. You know? So, I'm not saying that, you know, that I'm not sort of, sort of creating a huge guilt feeling here, but when you claim that you are sort of the safeguarders of this tradition of, of, of enlightenment, uh, you should also be as honest and admit that your behavior is not always up to the same set of, of values. Yeah. Well, can okay. I, may I react yeah. just quickly? Yeah. Um, the, the, the conversation this evening began with this, and you, I think you even, this little something of Eastern Europe that you are mm -hmm. trying to catch. And actually you didn't mention the authors that inspired you or the, concretely. We didn't have the time, I'm afraid. No, but, yeah. Um, and what we're doing now is trying to catch this little thing. Mm -hmm. So, but I get the feeling that every time someone makes a suggestion, it's like deconstructed or gone. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not catching this. <laughs> w what makes Eastern Europe Eastern Europe or what's so special about it? Well, you know, can I? Well, that, yeah, sure. Yeah, because but just one sentence. Yeah. That's absolutely, I mean, that on one level, just yeah. one sentence, there's a very easy explanation. The only thing which defines Eastern Europe is the Cold War. Because before that, Eastern Europe didn't exist. So in a way, it's, it's purely a political concept. In a way, it is. I mean, it did exist from the perspective of the Enlightenment philosophers. I mean, they discovered it. Um, no, you but know, not, not Eastern. Yeah. Did they use Eastern Europe as a term? Yes, yeah. L'Orient de l'Europe. That's how they called it, the east of Europe. And where did it start? Uh, somewhere in Bohemia. Okay. Yeah. I can give you the sources. No, but... No, but no, 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 no. I'm, yeah. what I'm wondering is yeah. because the, the German Empire reached all the way to Königsberg. The yeah. Hungarian... Um, yeah. The, the Austro-Hungarian Empire reached all the way to Lvov. So where exactly does Eastern Europe start? Well, you know, for someone like Herden, this is interesting. To him, uh, identity was all about nationality, about national character. So, as soon as he started to discern Slavic peoples, that's where the East started. So that was in Bohemia. So it's a racist concept. It is. It definitely is. And I, I think, you know, your, 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 your comment makes, of course, sense. It is... It is... <laughs> but, you know, there's something very... Uh, uh, almost dishonest about wanting to pinpoint what Eastern Europe is about. Because we never, ever have the same discussion about Western Europe, or if we have it, it's always the lofty kind of discussion. Western Europe is enlightenment, it's, oh, etc., it's, it's democracy. I think it is, I think it is. And, you know, one of the um, dilemmas for someone who is, you know, in my particular case, it, all, it was all because of literature, that's how it all started. Um, it's a difficult position when you're asked about, about Eastern Europe, because you know the complexity, and I would never ever dare to answer questions about those parts that I don't know very well, right? Um, and this is what I'm trying to say when the discussion is about Western Europe, people do not enter in such generalizations. We speak about Germany, or we sp speak about the Netherlands, or we speak about, I don't know, Scandinavian countries. But Eastern Europe, you know, it is such a vast territory. And although there is communism and there is nationalism, local varieties are so great and impressive that it's difficult to make these generalizations. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite you just Only one more question because we have question. to end, end up. The picture on your book, uh, Mr. Trojanov, can you explain the, the picture and did you well, choose it yourself? Or? No, that's, that's very easy to answer. I'm, I'm only responsible for the content of the book. <laughs> No, these two boys are of the same age. So if I were to interpret it as any other reader would, I would assume that since the two main characters knew one another from childhood, and since one of the two um, yes. blew, up, blew up the statue of Stalin, and Stalin here is lying on the ground, this is basically a photo montage um, which starts in their youth or in their childhood and then encompasses also what they did later on in, in life. So it's, it's a very playful cover. I actually like it because it, 
it provokes the imagination, but I couldn't tell you what it stands for. Okay. So, no more questions? Okay. Then I would like to thank you. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, I liked it. Thank you for this lively conversation. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And um, this book you can buy there. This book you can buy there. There are some other books of uh, these authors. And I would like um, to um, give you also um, the credits for being here. Thank you. A lot of credit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.